So what I want to do is I want to start with a really simple framework, which is a tension that we hold on to as Christians, and that is these two really important biblical messages, which are, number one, God saying, I love you, and number two, go love others, right? And holding on to that tension is really important for us as Christians. And we often tend to fall more into one of those lessons than the other. Or one of those messages more than the other. So for example, somebody who just wants to sit back and, and say, I just, God loves me and I just want to think about how God loves me. And I don't want to have to do anything about that. I just want to enjoy God's love. That would only be half of the Christian message, right? But other people get really caught up in living out their Christian life and serving and giving and doing, but they get disconnected with that core belief that God really loves me. And so that's why it's important that we hold on to both of those. Then, after we talk about that, I want to talk about voluntary following of the Spirit and involuntary following of the Spirit. And I'm going to share some things about my own life along the journey. So let's talk first about this first message. If you think about the whole of scriptures, from the beginning of Genesis all the way to the end of Revelation, there's one message that screams out at us, and that is God saying, I love you. It's what took place in the Garden of Eden. When you think about the Garden of Eden, God creates a beautiful place, and He walks with Adam and Eve, His presence is with them as they're enjoying this amazing place. But it's not just Eden, is it? I mean, God's beauty is everywhere. I love looking at like the big God's glory through things like mountains or whales, but it's also sometimes in the obscure, right? I mean, God's beauty in the things that we don't often even get to see. It's one of the neat things about the Brazilian rainforest or the tall mountains where you find these little pockets of things nobody's ever seen before and you go, wow, God created these things that we could discover and find to show us His, His beauty. Or even in the animal kingdom, just the, the glory of, I mean, why a peacock, right? Why? What's neat about modern science is how we can even find God in the little in ways we didn't know existed. What we now know that exists in a drop of water, there's a whole universe there. Right? What goes on in that drop of water is very different than we thought about 100 or 200 or 300 years ago. So in the Old Testament, God showed us His presence through this idea of Shekinah. The presence of God that existed amongst the Israelite people. And He did it in a very visual way. If you remember in the book of Exodus, Moses said after he brought the people out into the desert, he says, God, if you're not with us, we don't want to go anywhere. And God said, not only am I going to be with you, I'm going to be with you in a visual sense, right in the middle of the entire camp of all the Israelites. So there will be two million people camped out in these 12 tribes, but in the very center, I want you to place my tabernacle. And in the tabernacle, you will see my presence, no matter if it's day or night, no matter where you are, you can turn and look to the center, and you can see my Shekinah, my presence. When they built the temple, after the tabernacle had been done moving around, David said, we need to build a permanent dwelling place for the Lord. And they built the temple. If you remember, when the priests went to consecrate the temple, the scriptures say that the cloud of the Lord filled the house so that the priests could no longer minister because of the Shekinah, the presence of God. The glory of the Lord. So God took a physical manifestation to show us He's with us, that He loves us. One of the neat scriptures about Jesus in John chapter 1, when you know, we talked yesterday about the mystical gospel that Jesus comes from the heavens. But it says in John chapter 1 that the Word became enfleshed. So incarnation actually means incarnate, in flesh, in meatment, right? He became human. He became and took on flesh and bones like we do. But what's neat about this passage when you look at it in the Greek, 
he made his dwelling among us. What that actually says is that he tabernacled amongst us. Just like in the presence of the tabernacle, the glory, the Shekinah, God tabernacled through the enfleshment of Jesus Christ. Okay? So when you hear this message, I love you, does that solicit fear in us as Christians? Have you ever felt afraid of God's love? I have. I remember as a young Christian when it really made me confront my own humanity, my own brokenness, when it really made me look at, okay, God loves me not for who I act like or who other people think I am. God loves me for who I really am. That means I can be real and honest about the deepest, darkest, most disgusting parts about who I am, and God loves me. But what does that do if God loves you in that moment? If God loves you in your brokenness, then that means you have to be vulnerable. That means you have to be honest. That means there's an authenticity that comes from that. And that scares me, right? And I remember through many relationships when I first became a Christian, testing that. Like, and you don't always do it intentionally, but you kind of like test the waters. Like, if I really tell you what I think, will you still love me? It took me a couple years to kind of get used to the fact that disciples people that love God really love me for me in all my brokenness, right? So there are fears that come about, and it still happens to us, doesn't it? When someone says, I love you, and you go, yeah, but if you really knew me, would you still love me? And that fear, we have to work through and push through and, and, and it, in order to really engage in the relationships God wants. So what about the second message? Go love. Love others. You know, when you look at all the major go-to big picture passages. These are held in tension. How about the great commandment, right? Love God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind, and love your neighbor. So in other words, have this relationship with God that creates that security, that confidence, that comfort, that inclusion, your family, but then it has to also be generative. It has to do something. You need to love others. First John just maps it out really clearly. He said, you can't actually love God unless you love others. It's not possible. Because your Christianity will never actually be tested, we talked about this yesterday, until you actually have to engage in real relationship. Because then when you meet someone in the fellowship who doesn't think like you, who doesn't agree with you, who doesn't like you, who may hurt your feelings, who may wound you, and then it takes a lot of testing of our, okay, but can I still love? Can I still engage? That's what loving God is. One of the things that I think for us in our churches, the International Churches of Christ, we have to grow in is our understanding of what does it mean to bring about the kingdom of God to this earth. Now certainly, bringing about the kingdom means go and help other people become Christians for the kingdom. That's part of this. But is there more to it? Is there more work to do than just sharing our faith to see the kingdom realized on this earth? I want to read to you a quote from one of my new, current, uh, favorite authors. Has anyone ever heard of Rachel Held Evans? Okay, a couple of us. So she's one of the women I'm doing my work on in my PhD program, but she was a woman who was raised in a very evangelical, strong, committed, fundamental kind of church. She was the front row Christian, you know, the, the zealous young teenager who always had to be doing whatever the church was doing and knew her Bible verses and competed and went on camps. And, but then in her later years, she went through a disillusionment she had a lot of questions that weren't getting answered. She went on her own journey. She felt her own brokenness, her woundedness from the church, and she wrote about and tried to process that. And one of the things that she writes about is the idea of what the kingdom is really about. Because when you look at the Gospels and you look at Paul's writings, they're completely different in this regard. Jesus doesn't talk about the church except a couple times. What Jesus talks about is the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom, the kingdom. Paul 
because we only get to see Paul addressing churches, addresses the church, the church, the church, the church. Paul's not writing a message, an evangelical, uh, evangelistic message to non-Christians. That's not what he's doing. So he's writing about the church, but if we want to know what does it mean to see the kingdom of God brought on this earth, shared with the world around us, we've got to go to the Gospels, right? See, here's what she says. In contrast to every other kingdom that has ever been and ever will be, this kingdom belongs to the poor, Jesus said, and to peacemakers, the merciful, those who hunger and thirst for God. In this kingdom, the people from the margins and the bottom rungs will be lifted up to the places of honor, seated at the best spots, at the table. This kingdom knows no geographic boundaries, no political parties, no single language or culture. It advances not through power or might, but through acts of love, joy, and peace, missions of mercy and kindness and humility. This kingdom has arrived, not with a trumpet's sound, but with a baby's cry, not with a vanquishing of enemies, but with a forgiving of them, not on the back of a war horse, but on the back of a donkey, not with triumph and a conquest, but with a death and a resurrection. Isn't that amazing? When we think about what it means to bring about the kingdom, it actually challenges us much deeper than sharing your faith. Because bringing about the kingdom actually means that the way you behave, the way you treat people, the way you respond to people, what you do with your time, what you do with your resources, should be to show the world that Jesus' kingdom is here. It means that you should use your talents on your job for the kingdom. It means that in your neighborhood, you engage in your community in a way that brings about a kingdom culture, right? And sometimes that means that we see the fruit of that in people wanting to become Christians, but the fruit of that may not be shown even in us having 20 people that we help directly become Christians. Sometimes our effect may not be felt for 20 years, for 40 years, or in our lifetime. I want to tell you the story of one of the men I've studied. His name is Charles de Foucault. He grew up as a young French man. Um, he was orphaned at six years old and raised by his grandmother. When he was of age, he joined the military, and his grandfather passed and left him a huge inheritance. And so while he was a military man in France, he spent lots of money partying with all his fellow military buddies. He realized how empty it was, and in 1890, he decided to join the Trappist monks. Now, if you don't know anything about the Trappist monks, they're the kind of monks that pray all the time, right? So he said, maybe the answer for my life is to go into a monastery and devote myself to God through prayer. He realized quickly that wasn't for him, and so what he decided to do is he said, I really want to engage in the human side of spirituality. I want to know what it was like, not Jesus' active ministry where he's out evangelizing, but I want to know who Jesus was when he lived in Nazareth. What he grew up doing, what it was like working in the carpenter shop, what it was like living in a small village. And so he moves to Nazareth and he got a job, this is no joke, shoveling cow manure and just serving in the village that he was part of for a couple years in Nazareth. Wanting to connect with the human side of Jesus Christ in ministry. While he was a military uh, soldier, he was sent on a mission to Algeria in northern Africa, which is, if you don't know, highly Muslim. Okay, But he fell in love with the people there, and after he spent a couple years in Nazareth, he decided, I want to go live amongst the most remote Muslims in Algeria, 
And I know I can't go and share my faith with them, but I can go and be present. My presence can change lives. And so he did. This is his home. He built in the top of the mountains in a remote village in South Algeria. And he was a priest, so every day he would take communion by himself in his home. And he just decided to plug into the community and live amongst the Muslim people, hoping the light of Christ in him could transform them. He was so passionate about building a community of other people that would go and live in difficult places to be the light of Christ that he wrote out whole um, treatises about what would happen when people come and join him on his mission, how it would be organized, how they would function, what, but you're not in a single person, not a single person joined him his entire life. After a number of years of living there, he was shot and killed by the Muslims. And that seemed to be the end of the story. But his writings, his passion to be the light to those that are not willing normally to hear the light or aren't in places to normally hear the light, became a famous writing for a number of groups that formed. And there was a group called the Little Brothers of Jesus and another group called the Little Sisters of Jesus that started forming communities in the hard to evangelize places around the world. There's one on the west side of Chicago. There's one in a small village in South America. There's a number of them that have now popped up around the world. People that have decided going to live Jesus' presence is enough to transform lives. And now they're starting to see a great effect by these communities that all got started by one man who decided it's not just about vocally sharing your faith. It's actually about living like Jesus and being a light to the people around you, right? Now, a lot of us, we want to see results quicker than Charles de Foucault. And I get that. I do too. I want to see my life bearing fruit now. But we have to be faithful to believe that no matter what you think is happening, if you live in the light of Christ, you are making a difference. People are watching. People do notice. And it may be 10 or 15 years, but I've had so many stories of someone who'll come up who's worked with someone for 15 years and said, I'm ready to know what you're about. So being part of the kingdom and loving people has a lot more to do with than just sharing our faith. Why does that produce a lot more fear than just sharing our faith? I mean, it's scary walking up to someone and sharing your faith. I think it's a lot scarier to actually live in such a way that people are inspired to know what you're about. Because that means you have to actually think about your life all the time, and you've got to be vulnerable, and you've got to be real. Um, you know, Beth and I, when we were in Chicago in 1999, before the Sings came, we were leading adult ministries. And, you know, we were in our young 30s. We had two and four-year-old girls. Our girls were two and four. And the church leader before Tony asked us if we would come and lead the teen ministry. And our response, both of us, we were like scared. Like teenagers are scary people. <laughs> so we had young kids. We didn't know how to raise teenagers. We were old enough to not be cool anymore. Young enough to not have raised teenagers. We were kind of in that dead zone like for teens. And we had conversations with the church leaders and said, I don't know if we can do this. And I, we, one of the profound things that affected us was the woman's name was Lori Parson. And she said to Beth, you don't have to be cool. You don't have to relate to them. You don't have to know what music they listen to. You don't have to overcome all those insecurities and fears that you have. You just have to love. And if you love, it will help make a difference. And so we did. We decided to go in and just love. And it became a passion for us working with teenagers. And we ended up doing it for 17 years and had no idea what God was going to do with that. When you feel called, when the Spirit moves and you're asked to do something that scares you, if you address those fears and overcome them, you never know what God is doing. Right? So, what I want to do is ask, this is an open question. How does the Spirit call? Now, sometimes it may be like what happened with Beth and I. The church leader sits you down and says, we really would like you to take this ministry on. You know, sometimes the Spirit works through each other, through people, through direct, you know, engagement. 
How else does the Spirit call? Yes, sir. So Rob is saying, so I'm going to repeat this so that people can hear. That's okay. I'll just repeat. Um, Rob is saying if sometimes you just kind of hear, it may not be like a voice, but it's a voice, right? A movement of the Spirit in you that's telling you a conscience, uh, a movement. Uh, there is almost this uh, transcendent voice that may say something to you. Have you had that happen where your mind is saying you need to? Right? So sometimes we do feel a very direct engagement of the Spirit speaking to us. How else? How else does the Spirit speak to us? Through? Through the Scriptures, right? Have you ever been reading the Bible and go, wow, I never saw that before. God is saying something to me. This is exactly what I needed right now. Okay? So the Bible is the living Word of God. It's alive and active. Okay? How else does the Spirit speak? Preaching? Is that what someone said? Yeah, sometimes through a sermon. I mean, there's a lot of sermons. We may sit through sermon after sermon and, and go, that's great, that's great, that's great. And then all of a sudden there's a message that goes, wow, that's exactly what I needed, the Spirit speaking today. Okay? What else? Contemplation and meditation. There's a, in spirituality, they call it the apophatic approach to God. Emptying yourself to allow God to speak. It's not you doing the speaking and you doing the acting. You empty yourself and let God move. What else? Yes. Great one. Sometimes through circumstances. Paul literally calls this open and closing doors, right? The Spirit prevented us from going to Macedonia. Well, how? I mean, do you... You know, did the Spirit take on a physical manifestation and physically block Him? Or did He just start looking around and going, you know what, it's pretty clear that God's not opening doors right now. He's blocking our way to Macedonia, so we shouldn't try to go. It's clear He doesn't want us to go. We believe in that, right? This active engagement of the Spirit shows us sometimes through circumstance. Anything else? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say one more that I'm going to tie in later. Through woundedness. Through dark nights of the soul, through brokenness, God speaks. And we'll get to that one here in a little bit. So, when the Spirit moves, when the Spirit calls, a lot of times it's voluntary. What does that mean? We have a choice. Right? I mean, Jonah, was it a voluntary call? It was. God was persistent because he really wanted Jonah to go. But it was a voluntary call in the sense that you're presented an option you can go or not go. Now, what would be the difference with an involuntary call? Well, mental health struggles, physical struggles, sickness, someone getting, let's say, cancer. That's not a voluntary call. That's the involuntary God letting something or allowing something. I said, well, for the last six years we've led the church, it's been like this. Our kids do not want to do what our, their parents are doing. We have a real problem with our families. And so we start, you know, brainstorming how, what could happen, how we could help, you know, maybe we could come and visit. We had different ideas. So, you know, the week goes on. I meet with other people. Beth meets with other people. We're just, you know, busy in conference mode. Sunday morning, we're all together. There's a couple thousand people, and we're all worshiping together. And Beth and I are sitting in the middle of the back of the auditorium. And as Rob was saying, I felt God speak. I felt his hand on me. And I sat there, and I was kind of like, what is going on? I'm squirming. It was so noticeable. Beth leans over to me at one point. She's like, what's wrong with you? You know, and I'm like, I don't know. I don't. So I, I prayed during communion. I said a prayer. I said, God, if you are trying to tell me to move to Johannesburg, South Africa, then I need it to be really clear. So what I'm going to do, I'm going to stand up. I'm going to walk out the back of this auditorium, open the doors, go into the lobby. And if I bump into Justin Renton, 
Then I'm going to ask him what he thinks about the idea. But I'm like, there's no way, because everybody's sitting down having communion. So I stand up, I walk out the back, I open the door, and as soon as I push the door open, it literally gets met on the other side. And it's Justin Renton. And so Irene was with him, and so Irene went and said, I'll go find a seat in the back. So I pulled Justin aside, I said, listen, I feel like God is saying something to me. I don't know if I ate something weird for breakfast or what's going on, but do you think it's out of the question that we moved to South Africa to help you, like with your family ministry? And he looked at me, he goes, Dave, you're not going to ever believe this. On the airplane, when we sat down to, to fly here for this conference, Irene and I held hands and we prayed out loud, God put a burden so strongly on someone's heart to help us with our families that they will come and ask us if they can move to Johannesburg to come and help. So we're standing there looking at each other like, what do we do with this, right? So he runs and gets Irene, who's in the back of the auditorium, and he says, Irene, he tells her the story. She starts, if you don't know Irene Renton, she's very, you know, energetic. She starts jumping up and down during church and dancing and screaming. The Pactas are moving to Johannesburg. The Pactas are moving to Johannesburg. And I'm like, I haven't even talked to my wife. I mean, can we, you know. So I get Beth after church. We're walking back to the hotel. And again, you don't know Beth, so you don't realize what this really means. But I said, I tell her what happened. She's like, what's going on? I tell her what happened. She goes, I said, honey, what do you think? And she goes, I think we need to move to Johannesburg. I'm like, who are you? <laughs> and what happened with my wife? I mean, it was crazy. So what, when, when all this happens and you feel the call and you think it's, and you, you really are convinced, this is God, all these fears start coming. How will I live? We didn't have mission societies. Where will I live? Um, what do I do with my kids' education? What are we going to do for safety? I mean, everybody started, everyone then all of a sudden had a story about how dangerous South Africa was, right? Everyone had a story. And then I start calling, my girls were 12 and 14 years old at the time. And then I have people, I have elders telling me, this is the worst time to move your kids. You shouldn't move to South Africa. And you feel the spirit calling you and an elder saying, don't do this, that's stupid. And what do you do with that, right? You want to share now, Dolly? This is a good time. Okay, so that was my initial response. It was like, because I went into that same conference and the burden that I feel like God had placed on my heart had zero to do with Africa, but it did have to do with, um, it was actually things that were going on in our youth ministry. I, I was praying that I would go into the conference. Oops. I was praying that I would go into the conference and be challenged in my faith um, that I would learn to live more radically. That I, I thought, I always, I felt a very strong burden, probably more working with teens than I did with adults, that, that you had to live a life on the edge and one of inspiration to call any teenager to do anything. <laughs> because I, I just felt like they deserved so much to be inspired. They needed radical examples. They didn't need older Christians around them who were just dragging their feet and being like, you know, whatever, want to be a Christian? I don't know, it's kind of boring. Or, you know, they needed exciting things going on in their lives. So I was praying for inspiration. I did not know that it would come in the form of this, but um, I, I felt initially anyway, like, um, I think that sounds amazing. And when Dave says that that's not my natural reaction, my normal life is, Dave will have a fabulous idea like moving to a different continent or, you know, <laughs> taking over, you know, switching, quitting our jobs and going to school or, you know, he has had two or three of these in our married life. Um, but my normal reaction is I immediately have about 16 reasons why it's a horrible idea and why it's not of God and it will fail. And I, I can tell him very clearly. So that's my normal demeanor. So this was somewhat of a miracle and sort of a, a, a special thing. But I think as with everything, um, this is a, a big example that involved moving our family. but. 
Um, we have little decisions like that to step out on faith every day. We have, you know, God's nudge or call, um, and we have a choice. And I think as, as you make those decisions that stretch you by faith or they stretch you out of your comfort zone, um, and as they begin to unfold, like Dave said, the reality of life sets in pretty quickly. So that was just the excitement of that miraculous thing that we felt at that moment had a, took on a lot of forms over the course of the next four years when we actually did it and we moved there. And um, the reality set in of our kids, as he said, the 12 and 14, you know, you don't typically think of 12 and 14 year olds as being your most emotionally unstable or stable ages of life. <laughs> There's usually a lot going on. Um, a lot of feelings of being shared at that time. So the reality of that and dealing with them in a different context, um, the reality of culture and lifestyle and security, as Dave mentioned, the, just a lot of processing, the reality of the state of the church and that we didn't just, we got there and hit the ground running. There wasn't time to really acclimate. There was a ton of work to do. And, um, the, I think the, the thing that I remember so um, intensely about that time was I had, luckily I started a journal when this, when this unfolded. I started a journal and I wrote, I wrote every single answered prayer that had happened. Everything we prayed, every, there was literally probably 50 things that had to happen that had to specifically come into play, just getting visas, I, down to everything, down to very simple, minute details. But um, I kept a journal of that, and I wrote in it what we prayed, when we prayed it, and how it got answered. And I think that that journal, when we were going through days where our kids were just, you know, not happy, they were just being 12 and 14, and and in another country and none of us had any friends and you know it just was such there were so many emotional things but during that time how many times I went back to that journal and had to recount what God did what God did to get me here and I think that's our life I think it's the story of the Israelites it's them they hated slavery obviously who wouldn't and they get called out but then their life on the road to the promised land was not what they had bargained for you know they didn't, they didn't like their circumstances, their surrounding, their food. They got bored with it, they got, and they complained, and they cried out to God. I think that's, that's working through our fears. I think we work through fears most in our desert times and in our wanderings. Um, I think it, it's us, it, we were doing it, and we made this decision, obviously, as a family, but that internal battle that each of us has to wrestle out with God um, we really literally have to wrestle our fears to the ground. So um, I think I would just encourage you with whatever you're being called to in your, in your life that, that you keep whatever, whatever scriptures you're going to hold on to, whatever person you're going to talk to to go through the battle with, whatever um, prayer journal or however you do it, um, you have to recount the ways. You have to be able to draw on that personally because you're the only one who can walk through those fears with God. Amen. You know, we had fun. There was a lot of great moments. This is how they lured us when we went to visit. It took us to pet baby tigers and lions. My girls both said, great, let's go. And then, you know, the reality sets in. Uh, I showed you a couple of these. Um, I want to talk, though about something I think we need to talk more about, and that is the involuntary call. That's the struggle, the sickness, the pain, the challenges to our health, the challenges to our circumstances, um, and I think even things like, I've, I've counseled two brothers over the last few years whose wives were unfaithful to them, and wanted to repent, wanted to reconcile, but just even dealing with the pain and the woundedness of adultery, we don't choose these things, right? They happen, and we have to deal with them. In September of 2016, right when we're in these conversations with Tony and Melanie about them moving, 
I had been traveling. We had a big conference in uh, the summer in St. Louis called Reach, and it was busy. Then in West Africa, we had another conference for the West African church leaders in Ghana. And I went and I was one of the speakers and we did a lot of training for the church leaders and we did a lot of church training for the church. And I got on the airplane to come home and I just felt something was broken inside me. And so I remember texting Beth and I said, I don't know what's going on, something's not right, I'm not doing well. And I made it home, took my suitcase, put it on the floor, laid in bed for a couple days. I couldn't, I couldn't do anything. I couldn't unpack my suitcase. I didn't want to open the mail. I couldn't take phone calls. I didn't want to talk to anybody. It was a very dark time. And I didn't know what was going on because I'd never had challenges in my own mental health. And so the church leader fortunately was very gracious and he said, why don't you take off whatever you need to take off. You need a month, you need two months, you need three months, great. But go see someone and get some help. And so I did two things. I called, I started finding a psychiatrist who could diagnose what was going on with me. And I found a counselor so I had someone I could talk to outside of my environment. And so what ends up happening over a series of appointments and tests is I get diagnosed with four things. General depression, general anxiety, ADHD, which all my friends knew, but it was finally official, and sleep deprivation. And so within a matter of weeks, I was on multiple medications. Now, if you've ever known someone who has, or you yourself have ever struggled with any of those things, you realize there's no such thing as taking a pill and everything gets better. That's not how it works. So you take a pill that may address some of the symptoms, but the side effects that go with it sometimes can be worse than the original symptoms. And so during a period of time, and right, and then the things arrive like right when this is all happening, right? Which I think, I still believe God brought them for us to help minister to us. Um, a couple months into this, as I'm trying to sort out my life and what's going on with me, and I'm in the middle of all these medications, I looked over at, my, at the table next to my bed, and these are the medications I was taking at that time. I mean, that's how many, just, there was just a lot going on. And if you've, so what's interesting about struggling with mental health and depression is it's so dark. It's so hopeless. Like, you can't see, you know, when you're in a better mental place, you think, well, you know, I know I'm going through rough time, but in a, a month or in a week or in a couple months, I'll get through this. But when you're depressed, that's not true. You just can't see that it's ever going to get better. Right? So... It's dark, not just for the person going through it, but it's hard for your family. And I actually wanted to have Beth share um, about just how it was for her, because I had all my own fears about what was going on in my life and would I ever get better and these medications make me crazier and I don't like people and I mean, you name it, I had all these things happening but it was really, really hard for Beth, too. So I thought maybe she could share a little bit about that. Obviously, when you're, you're married or you're in a family, you're, well, in marriage, you're learning constantly through life how to live as one, because that's God's call. But that's a journey. You don't just say, I do, and then, oh, presto, we're one. Um, it's like a, it's a wrestling match to become one. Like, um, and so that, I think so it is with families. You don't, your family's your family. Uh, you're, you're in it through the thick and thin. You're in it with your kids. You're in it with your extended family, you know, all of it. And so I think when all this was going on with Dave, um, there were obvious, like he said, the medications have side effects, but it is really scary when you've not um, encountered something like that, you know, dealt with it with your own family members. Um, 
And I think we both had a lot to learn. The, I think learning to accept and surrender to what his new limitations were, um, learning how to care for myself so I didn't, you know, we've probably all heard of caregiver fatigue, that you just, the dailiness of it, that I couldn't, I couldn't control anything, I couldn't be happy enough, or maybe if I did this, or maybe this will make him. The, and I think I just, the, the initial months you feel like it's, it's gonna be something like, oh, they're just gonna snap out of it. When the, you know, it just is not, uh, it's, a, it's not, it's not a, any of that. But um, I think we, especially if you're a person who likes to fix things, I think moms are good at fixing and we, we care and we fix. And when you can't fix, there's a lot of surrendering that has to take place. Um, and I think the uh, learning how to have boundaries, all of that, I think, I think maybe for you, it, and maybe it's a different situation and this hasn't been part of your story, but maybe it's caring for aging parents or dealing with financial situations, job struggles, kids' challenges, marital problems, you know, just uh, maybe this isn't a new, but you're having to almost define and redefine what your new normal is. What's, because uh, you want things to just be a stage and then you hope for that stage to be over. Like, then it's all just gonna be back to normal. And a lot of times in marriage, life, circumstances, it's just not, there's, you don't ever really go back to that normal, you have to find a new one. And so I think that journey, again, like I was saying before, there's a lot of internal wrestling. So there was the immediate trying to control and fix, but then when we settled into, okay, this is, this is how life's gonna be now. Um, the, the journey was for me to figure out how was I going to uh, work this out with me and God. And I think what draws me in, I read, I read the Psalms in a different way now. You know, the, um, the psalmist, like for example in Psalm 103, um, he says, praise the Lord, O my soul. And there's a lot of Psalms where they're obviously praising God and they're obviously remembering things about their life and whatever, but there's uh, so many phrases like, be at rest, O my soul, where the psalmist is talking to his own soul. And so the conversation switches from his talking to God to him, his working out his own business. And, you know, why are you downcast, O my soul? And I think a lot of these dark times, what they, they do for us individually when we're learning this new normal is we do a lot of wrestling with our within our own soul we we pray and we're like and we we say things maybe that we thought we would never say to god or that maybe we even felt like would be inappropriate but um but i think there's just there's so much um internal wrestling like god why just the why are you why are you doing this why did you allow this and i'm mad about it and I can't handle this and um, this I'm at the I know you you wouldn't ask me more than I could bear but yes you are I believe <laughs> you absolutely are testing me more than I can bear and I but just just the the kind of prayers and the wrestling with myself uh, you know just where you find yourself yelling like be at rest once more oh my soul you know like <laughs> you're like trying to drill it into yourself um, but I think you you find different things in the scriptures come to light during these times um, you have to search for new tools I I can remember so clearly the books I read during that time and ongoing I I started attending a class. I went to an eight-week class offered at um, a local area group with, I don't I, the National Alliance for Mental Illness, I think they had a group like that in South Africa as well, but um, I did an eight-week class to learn how to be a caregiver of someone with mental health problems. I had to do a lot of reading on it. I had to learn. I saw a counselor myself. I. Um, found I mean we had to work out I think a marital dynamic is it's really it's really vulnerable to not feel like yourself and to have all this new stuff going on and we had to work out that um, who were the sisters that were I was going to be able to tell 
literally everything that was going on to, who were the people that we were just going to involve in our lives and really be, you know, have no holding back going on. Um, and you can't do that with everyone. You can't just, you know, share with the whole world these, these really private, um, intimate things going on, but you need to have somebody, you need to have someone that you can confide in that knows. So it was really, like Dave said, such a blessing that the minute all this was happening, Tony and Melanie, they're, they're like, suddenly, um, we're like, can you come over every day and possibly live with us? And um, no, because it was just, it was just God actually sent them to San Antonio yeah, for no other reason except <laughs> to be those people for us. But thank you for sh thank you for listening. Yeah, I think some people would disagree with that was why they were in San Antonio, but that's our story. They were there for us. You know, God, God moves in dark times, and I've come to believe God moves powerfully in dark times. Um, I started seeing a counselor. The first appointment I had, I told him I told him my story. I spent about 45 minutes just kind of unpacking, here's my life. And he looked at me and he said, you're in the middle of an adult midlife spiritual crisis. He, he made, you know, it was a spiritual midlife crisis. And he told me a book that I should read and where we started on this journey. But what I started doing and understanding as I was digging was that there was a big part of my spiritual life that was missing. And for me, it was study. It was going deeper and pursuing deeper things because that's the way I think God made me and it's what I needed to do. And so through a series of the next year, we wrestled with what does that mean? And I visited the school that was in town that had a PhD program in spirituality and God did all kinds of miracle things that would be a whole nother sermon to tell you about all of what God did to make that clear. But what I really started realizing as I started looking around to my brothers and sisters were there's a lot of us, it may not look the same as it does with me, but there's a lot of us that get stuck in our midlife. That we don't know what to do when the things we always used to do don't work anymore. Or when we feel numb, or when we feel like we've lost hope, or when we, the scriptures don't move us the way they did, or there's all kinds of ways that that looks. And so what I ended up doing when I started going to study was to study this. I want to I wanna look at the spiritual midlife. I want to look at the dark night. I want to look at the journey, and, um, which I haven't actually shared publicly. We just decided this week, but um, my dissertation work, what I'm going to write about is adults that fall out of their faith story and find their way back in. And that's what I'm going to do my research and my work in because this is what I feel drawn to is me, I feel drawn to people like me, my story, that, that it's hard, that midlife is hard, and how do we do midlife spirituality? So there was a lot of fears, and I just want to share a couple like practical things that we've done. You've probably picked this up even from what we've shared, but there's three big ones for me. Prayer is so important, and prayer is important for a lot of reasons. It's important because I need to talk to someone who will no, love me no matter what, and I can always trust, right? God is, God's not going anywhere. So he can hear it, he can take it, I need that, but it helps me refocus, it helps me remember, it helps me, and I pray a lot for open and closed doors. God, show me or show me not, right? I need to know. Um, it also helps me choose love over fear. Scripture is really important for all of us. I know we're a people of the book. And we need, the reason we need to stay in the scriptures is not to check off a box every day where we can say, I had a quiet time. You're building a bank. You're putting gold into the account every time you open and take in scripture. Sometimes you're aware that the bank account goes up and sometimes you're not. But you're de making deposits and there's times you're going to have to draw deeply on those deposits. And it feels like you're running your bank account down to zero. And maybe you're even taking a loan, right, for future quiet times or future times in Scripture. But it really is true that the more you take in of God's Word, the more that life just starts residing in, in you. And I think that's why it's so important. And we don't need to get into all those details. But fellowship is the other big one for me. 
And I've realized I'm actually not an extrovert, I'm more of an introvert. If you give me a choice on any given day, I'd rather take a book over a person. But I really need people in my life. So part of why I chose to come out of the ministry and study is because I'd rather do studies, but I need people, and even us introverts who'd rather choose a book need people, sometimes more than we even know, right? But I need it for perspective because I get whacked out in my own thinking, which Tony and Melanie have talked me off the ledge many, many, many times. I need the partnership knowing that we're doing this together. We're building the kingdom. You do your part, I do mine. We're in it together. I need a lot of advice um, in my life, and sometimes it doesn't line up. One of the things I do when I feel the Spirit call is I make columns, what people say, yes, no. You know, when we moved to Africa, the columns were even. And so it was like, well, well then what does God say? Because the advice isn't helping here. But a lot of times it does. But lastly, I need encouragement. Because, man, I get beaten down and I get accused and guilted out and I say something and someone reacts and I go, man, I probably should have, you know. And so sometimes I just need people to say, you're awesome. Do you ever need that? Okay, I'll tell you right now, you guys are awesome. But this all does come down to, um, as we saw with Jonah, as we see with us, a response. What do we do when we hear the Spirit call? We can say yes, we can say no. God gives us those freedoms, so why say yes? I think if we say no, it's usually because it hurts us. I think God's plan for us to go to Africa was for our benefit. And it, it helped the church, but it helped us. And I think God taking me through my depression and all of what it taught me, um, even though it, I wasn't, it was involuntary, by embracing it, engaging it, learning from it, I realized it was to help me. Right? And so I just, more than anything, want to encourage you. I know the Spirit works in your life, and I know the Spirit speaks to you in, in the way that it speaks to you. And I know it produces fear, because it does in all of us. But that's what we're always fighting through, is our own fears, our own challenges, our own struggles, our own darkness. And we've got to find our own path back. And even though we want to do it, we understand collectively that we're in that journey. There's something about those journeys that's very personal. And you're fighting those, and it feels like sometimes you're very alone. And even though no one understands exactly what you're dealing with, um, we do need each other in those difficult times. So that is what we had to share with you. And um, I don't know if we actually want to do Q&A or we can have people talk later, but um, that's all I got for you today. So.